Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. I am very happy to see so many of you here in Kaulak, uh, some very known faces and other uh, new faces. And uh, I do hope this will become a very uh, interactive and stimulating discussion. I apologize at the beginning for this very formal setting that was set up, and partly it's a little difficult, I take it, for people to see the screen. Uh, we are neg negotiating. Maybe we can, in the lunch break or tonight, uh, make it a little less informal. Uh, well, the, the word the Wittgenstein Center was mentioned several times here. Uh, uh, just f you find outside some information. It es essentially is a collaboration uh, between uh, three groups who do demographic research in the Vienna area. Uh, the oldest uh, is the uh, population program at the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, YASA. Uh, then there is the Austrian Academy of Sciences as the Vienna Institute of Demography. And then more recently at the VU, the Vienna University of Economics and Business, there also is a demography group. And uh, they are working together and got some joint funding under the Austrian Wittgenstein grant scheme. And uh, so that is the, the reason for the, the Wittgenstein Center, which of course is named after the Austrian uh, philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein, who, who then worked in, in Cambridge. Now, uh, when trying to uh, see how to introduce this seminar, I was uh, going back and, and reading the most recent reports uh, of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. As you are aware of, they have uh, recently completed uh, the fifth assessment report. I shouldn't say they, because I myself served as a lead author, as did uh, Levin Zhang, who is here. Uh, we both served in the working group three, which uh, deals sort of with the mitigation of climate change. And the working group one deals with the, the natural science part. And the working group two uh, deals with, uh, well, impacts, uh, vulnerability, and adaptation. So they have a very nice chart here in, in one of their publications that I copied, uh, which really helps to define the terminology that is being used. And increasingly, there is sort of consensus that that is the right terminology, because there often is a lot of confusion. What is risk? What is vulnerability? What is hazard? And so on. So I try to quickly explain uh, this chart and the terms involved. and. It would be great if we also could, uh, when we talk about these issues, try to adhere uh, to this terminology. So what you see here is on the, on the left-hand side, uh, you see the climate. The natural science is dealing with this. So there is some natural variability to the climate. And then there is the anthropogenic climate change. Uh, the change in climate that with very, very high certainty now is assessed as being caused by our human action. Now, uh, these changes in the climate affect what we usually call the hazards. That is sort of the natural hazard. That, is, that happens even sort of without the people being involved. That's the new hurricanes that come. That is sea level rise. That is some changes uh, to the natural environment. And I give you the more formal definitions of these terms on the next slide, but I just introduce it intuitively. But if there is just a hazard, is there's a big storm, without people or humans being exposed to it, well, um, there is no particular risk for human well-being there. So the hazard alone is not enough. There needs to be exposure. And this is this other circle here. So exposure means essentially uh, human beings being there where the hazard takes place. Like if the, the recent uh, uh, cyclone that we saw on, on the Philippines uh, would have just passed over an uninhabited island. Yes, there would have been some trees fall down and so on, but it wouldn't have affected the human well-being. So humans need to be exposed to the hazard. And several of the papers today that we hear today and, and tomorrow actually deal with this issue. Where are people living and how are they exposed to the hazard? But being exposed to hazard is, is not necessarily a risk in itself. There also needs to be this third element, which is the vulnerability. Uh, if they are perfectly protected against something, let's say there's a heat wave in Las Vegas where everybody has air conditioning <laughs> and so people uh, are exposed to it, but uh, the, the vulnerability is relatively low there. So, and that is actually where much of the social science also comes in. Who is vulnerable? And uh, the scientific research community has said, mostly in the past, and the, the non-demographic community, if I may say so, dealing with uh, vulnerability, has seen this more as an aggregate phenomena. They talk about social vulnerability of populations, of communities, very much a system view. 
uh, but what uh, we have recently pointed at and what is also the topic of this seminar is that there is differential vulnerability even within communities and even within individual households of course different households may be different vulnerable but even within households they may be according to the age they are very young and the very old may be more vulnerable than the middle aged and uh, women in many cases are more vulnerable than men so there are even within households these differentiations so this is really this, both the exposure and the vulnerability are um, related to some socioeconomic uh, processes, uh, uh, sort of the development pathways, the so-called SSPs that Adrian had already mentioned and we talk a little more about, and then there are adaptation and mitigation actions, and then governance and institutions, of course, play also a big role, and then uh, sort of there's this link back from the human action then through the emissions to the anthropogenic climate change. So that's how the circle closes. Well, I put up here some of the, the formal definitions, but I don't think we have to spend the time now. So again, the hazard is the potential occurrence of a natural or human-induced physical event. And then the exposure is the presence of people, but also livelihoods, species, or ecosystems, so it's vulnerability in a broader sense. Then the vulnerability itself is the propensity or predisposition to be adversely affected. And they all are combined then in this notion of risk, is the potential for consequences where something of value, I mean human life is the most valuable but other valuable things as well, is at stake and where the outcome is uncertain and then even recognizing the diversity of values, because particularly when it comes to material losses, some people value it more than others, or certain things are more valued. But the, the thing about the, the value of life, that tends to be something that is uh, universally appreciated across all cultures. Okay, now this brings me to another conceptualization that has er actually underlying the uh, the project that was just is being finished now that was mentioned is a European Research Council uh, advanced grant on the topic uh, forecasting society's adaptive capacity uh, to climate change where this seminar really is sort of the concluding meeting and the way I've conceptualized this here and some of you may have seen I also had a keynote in the IPCC uh, conference in, in Marrakesh some time ago on population environment interactions. So again, we separate between the, the natural science part, the global climatic change as it happens up in the left corner, and zoom into somewhat more detail into the human population. So we, the humans, uh, are indeed causing climate change through our consumption, mostly consumption of energy, but also land use change. And that causes the greenhouse gas emissions, which causes climate change. But again, uh, not all humans do it equally, and there has been a lot of analysis on how uh, changes in the structure and size of human populations impact um, the energy consumption. And some of the work that uh, Brian O'Neill and, and, and Levin uh, uh, have first done at Yaza and now are doing at, at NCAR uh, is, is really one of the, the leading attempt to, to try to disentangle the different factors of population size and household structure, urbanization, and so on, as they feed into different pathways of greenhouse gas emissions. But it is also us, it is also the humans that have to come up with solutions, so what we call the mitigation, the reduction of uh, our emissions, and that is uh, through innovation, through technological advances, that in, in the end, hopefully, it will reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions without compromising our well-being and um, even economic growth. This is this notion of green growth that we can have economic growth while at the same time reducing our emissions. So these all are the impacts of uh, human populations on the climate. So what has received much less attention so far is the, the feedback. So to say the effect of a given already unavoidable climate change on our human well-being. And what you see here is uh, that uh, the global circulation models show you that there are likely ranges. There still is a lot of uncertainty, but the uh, IPCC clearly defines some ranges on future temperature, humidity, 
extreme events like big storms and so on, and sea level rise uh, in different parts of the world. And that somehow affects our health and mortality. It affects our, our livelihood and uh, also the, the movement of people, a sort of environmentally induced uh, migration is a big topic these days. But here again, it is not all the people even living in a given territory being affected in the same way by this. There is, as we said before, differential vulnerability. And this vulnerability differs by some of the uh, human uh, sort of aspects or demographic dimensions that we are considering. It differs by age, it differs by sex, gender, it differs by the level of education, it differs by the place of residence, household structures, and then of course some of the economic variables such as income and so on. So this is uh, really the, the topic of the conference uh, now. Uh, we used to have uh, a study uh, in of the past five years where we zoomed into the education as a driver of adaptive capacity and vulnerability and outside you find uh, a just published uh, hard copy of a special issue of the journal Ecology and Society that has many studies focusing on education as an important factor relative to income and other factors in terms of affecting our vulnerability to natural disasters. And there's enough copies that we carried over from Vienna for everybody, and I encourage you uh, to look into this. Um, just a word, you may wonder, what does education have to do with demography? Education is often uh, seen as uh, sort of a, a social aspect that may or may not be relevant. Uh, and something that is sort of assigned to people uh, rather than really changing people. And therefore, we recently had done a lot of research to demonstrate very clearly and unambiguously uh, that there's good reason to assume what we call functional causality from education to all kinds of desirable outcomes ranging from health uh, to income and also in, in reducing vulnerability. So education is not just a proxy for socioeconomic status. As, as many of us social scientists tend to see it, but it really changes even the structure of our brain. We went deeply into neuroscience. There is um, Eric Kandel, who got the Nobel Prize in uh, Medicine and Physiology in the year 2000 uh, for his work. It's a book is called In Search of Memory and, and other books like how do we store knowledge in our brains? And he makes it very clearly that every learning experience, particularly if we repeat it, builds new synapses in our brains and makes us physiologically different from before the learning. He very clearly said, like in a meeting that I was with him, he said, now let's repeat this point again. And I repeat again, education changes our brains. Now when you walk out through this door, you are physiologically a different person as when you walked in. Education does some real change for the rest of our life. And that's very important when we look at the effects of education. It just is not something assigned or self-sorting, but it that has a real change. And similar to age and to sex, it has both a sort of a physiological as well as uh, some social um, uh, connotations and, and forces. Okay, uh, it, and we don't have to go into this into more depth, but it is an enhancement of cognitive skills, changes our risk behavior, uh, it attends our personal planning horizon, and we also speeds up our learning curve so we can learn from past damage and gives us better access to information, changes health-related behavior, and so on. Now uh, let's uh, jump to what uh, Adrian already mentioned. Uh, how does the climate change modeling community uh, that is primarily concerned with the f physical side, the biophysical modeling of uh, weather and climate, how do they deal with the, the changing socioeconomic world around us? Well, the first generation of scenarios, the so-called stress scenarios, were led by a group at Yaza under the leadership of Neboša Nakicenovic. And um, they, uh, on the socioeconomic side, were relatively simple, not to say simplistic, because they only had two variables. They looked at total population size and total GDP. And population essentially served as a denominator there. Like you have per capita GDP, per capita energy consumption, and so on. 
Now, uh, the, the most recent work that is also reflected already in the, the fifth assessment report to some extent uh, is based on a new effort by the international uh, impact uh, and vulnerability modeling society, international community in that field uh, to be uh, more detailed. And there is this SSP, this Shared Socioeconomic Pathways, were recently developed. And in what I call the human core of the SSPs, of course, there are many more uh, economic and energy related aspects to this. Uh, we have uh, population scenarios for all countries in the world that are sort of three dimensional in terms of age, sex, and the level of educational attainment. And in addition, we have some projections of urban uh, rural place of residence. And then uh, we also hear uh, today, or tomorrow actually, more about then consistent uh, GDP scenarios that are consistent with the human capital trends. So again, why was education included in this? Because it has been by agreed uh, that education is a single most important source of observable population heterogeneity next to age and sex. And it is a, a measurable, a good indicator that is also stable and consistent. And it really tries to capture in as comprehensive as possible way the empowerment of people to do what they want to do and their social status. Um, well, it was already mentioned by Adrian that there is this special issue of uh, population and environment uh, that uh, describes these scenarios and uh, also summarizes what we know about the, the mitigation side uh, as was uh, presented at this Canberra workshop. Now, just uh, to, to repeat again the, the logic of these SSPs, it, the, the, the challenge there is really to at the same time capture two dimensions. Uh, capture the socioeconomic challenges for mitigation, it means our capacity to reduce greenhouse gas emissions essentially, and the socioeconomic challenges for adaptation. Uh, and these, of course, are the same forces. And along the diagonal, you see on the left-hand side very rapid development that is also viewed as a sustainable development. And on the upper right corner uh, is a stalled development and a fragmented world that has high challenges on both sides. Just to illustrate quickly how what is sort of the, the demographic scenarios behind this, you see uh, the pyramids uh, by age, sex, and the color gives you the level of education, with red having no education, yellow be having primary education, light blue secondary, and dark blue tertiary education. This is the world today, essentially, on the left-hand side. It still looks like a pyramid. Uh, it's now a bit over 7 billion. And then we have the two most extreme, the SSP1, which is the rapid development, which in technological sense also is the sustainable development. There you combine uh, low fertility, uh, also increases in life expectancy with very rapid further expansions of education. So this is a, a pyramid that is not unlike uh, what the European pyramid, for instance, looks today. So this is a very developed society. And then on the contrast, on the, in the same year, 2050, under SSP3, you, you would see uh, uh, a pyramid that still is much younger because fertility is higher under these conditions. And also in many countries, the education progress is stalled and actually the attainment distribution worsening in some countries because uh, high fertility is combined with no further progress in education. So you have even in absolute terms larger numbers of uneducated people in the young ages. Overall to 2100, these are just the scenarios. This is the SSP2, which is sort of the middle of the road, or if you want the most likely scenario. It is quite optimistic, you see, as uh, the world population uh, is, is likely under this scenario to peak. And of course, the educational composition is improving partly because much of the improvement is already embedded uh, in today's education structure, where in most countries the young are better educated than the old. This is SSP1, the very rapid, almost unrealistically rapid uh, scenario that most countries would follow the path of, let's say, South Korea or Singapore over the last decades. And this is the most pessimistic, uh, continued very high population growth and little progress in education. And then we have this SSP4 as a divided world in a way. You see both the blue and the red area expanding, so we have larger um, inequality in societies. 
Okay, well, this is not directly the topic, but I just wanted to give it you as a background. What we think now is uh, a great opportunity for the demographic community to come into this analysis of the consequences of uh, climate change uh, through our study and our experience in the study of uh, differential vulnerability. Uh, so, um, so far much of, the, not, not many demographers have dealt with climate change. This, I think is, this is to start with and uh, much of the work that has been done so far has tried to explain how demographic forces uh, contribute um, to the uh, emissions of greenhouse gases and how uh, reducing population growth, for instance, may uh, contribute to the mitigation of climate change. Now with this seminar, uh, th one of the hopes is that we also open up, help to open up a new field where we demographers can bring in one of the skills that if we very successfully applied to, for instance, the study of health risks. Uh, whenever we study infant mortality or maternal mortality or any kind of other cause of mortality, we tend to look at risk factors. We look at differential risks by age, by sex, and by many other dimensions. So this is our daily bread in a way in, in other fields, and I think we could and should apply this also to the, the risk of vulnerability to natural disasters. So we can bring these skills and the associated methods to the benefit of the disaster vulnerability community. Traditionally, this community tends to focus primarily on the spatial dimension, where are people living? And not so much, but increasingly also what they call social vulnerability of systems, but less on the vulnerability of individuals, as we demographers tend to do. Uh, but we know that even, as I said initially, within the same communities, different households and are vulnerable to different degrees, and even within households, the, the risks tend to be different by age, sex, and other demographic dimensions. Well, I want to conclude uh, with a little explanation why we are here in Kaolak today. And it happened to be um, almost 10 years ago. Uh, you all know about the tsunami on the 26th of December 2004 that hit the whole uh, Andaman coast and the large parts of uh, Indonesia. And uh, as uh, Vipam Prachwapmop of, of Chula and, and myself and together with people at the University of Singapore were engaged in what was called the Asian Meta Center for Population and Sustainable Development Analysis, I had a scheduled visit uh, to Phuket for a research project uh, just about a month after the tsunami had hit. And, and then uh, Vipan and myself, we had a, a minivan and were driving here to Kaulak. And, and this is not far from here, just a few hundred uh, meters away. Uh, the only house that was left there, it was a fishing village. For some reason, it was stronger uh, than other constructions. And uh, yeah, this is one of the hotels around here. It's not ours, you can <laughs> but it, it's just uh, next by. And, um, Yes, uh, as you, at that point, I didn't believe that any hotels would be constructed on this same place anymore. Uh, it, it seems to be the end of tourism here, but uh, tourism is very resilient. And actually, it's part of the reason when to, tomorrow we'll have this round table of local people, also the head of the local tourist industry, to see why did they reconstruct the hotels, what is their perception of a risk. Uh, of course, a tsunami is different. It's not climate-induced. But we thought it is sufficiently similar or isomorphic, as you used to say, of the same nature as some of the uh, disasters that may strike as a consequence of climate change. So since we have this real disaster where we could study all kinds of vulnerabilities and, and responses to it, uh, we thought that it would be an appropriate location for having this conference. Thank you very much.